There are millions of dollars a year to be made in small business. I'm your host, Matthew. And I'm your co-host, Nick. Welcome back to Founder Framework. We break down the success of distinguished entrepreneurs to uncover how you can replicate their success. Here, you'll receive actionable insights that will guide you to your dream business, project, and lifestyle. Now, let's get into the podcast. Today, we get a masterclass on how to sell, how to tell a story, and how Christian Zerone was able to land massive brands like Omega and Rolex as his own clients, despite competing against bigger companies and with less experience. We also get to hear on a more personal level where his priorities lie as an entrepreneur and how that can relate to all of us. With that said, let's get into the podcast. Uh, And yeah, tell us about yourself. Yeah. Hi, guys. Again, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, like long story short, uh, I was, was in college seven seven years ago. And um, while I was having fun, I was partying. I said, OK, you know what? What could be a good use of my time? Maybe something productive. So I started a little um, little retail store for vintage watches. I had like ninety three hundred dollars, generally speaking. The watch industry, it takes hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to, to enter this industry. So I had a very, very small amount of money, um, but took that took that small amount of money and, and built it very, very, very slowly. Uh, I learned over the last, over the, over the next seven years that were come that um, while retail is interesting and certainly profitable, and I, I did do very well in retail, that my real skill set uh, was actually just in, in creating content and storytelling. Uh, I was using my storytelling ability to make tens of thousands of dollars when I realized in the last year I could actually use that same ability to make a, a larger multiples of that uh, if I were to sell those skills to companies uh, that are much larger than mine with much more profitable products. So instead of using my ability to sell uh, vintage Rolex, I can use my ability to generate uh, um, a passion and interest around a golf tournament, for PGA Tour, or around a financial vehicle for uh, either in either in finance or or in insurance, whatever it might be. They can pay a hell of a lot more than I can generate off of selling my products. So that's uh, that's that's what I do in a nutshell. Cool. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. I, I just want you to, uh, you, you piqued my interest when you said, when you pivoted from, from rebranding into, into leveraging a new skill. Uh, talk, us about, talk us through about how you learned how to basically market that skill and, and, and build that up from, from the start. Yeah, so I, I I was pretty fortunate that this. So, so I, I went into watches kind of blind, right? I, I didn't go into watches because I saw that it was going to be a huge market. I got into watches because I, it interested me, and that was really it. I just so happened, it just so happened to be that that industry was beginning to bloom, right? Uh, so so as I started doing doing well with that, I I went on YouTube to to meet more people and to create kind of a, a you know a, a fill some white space you know for lack of a better term and uh, I realized that who are the sorts of people that you meet by speaking about luxury items people in control of companies people that can afford these items so fast forward three or five years later which was a year and a half ago and I said wait I know all of these guys that are either independently only with their own company rich as shit, or they run significant pieces of major corporations and they would love to work with work with me for, and, and, and have me do what I do for watch companies for them, but I don't offer that service. So I said one day, why don't I, why don't I just offer it to them, right? Selling a Rolex to me or selling an Omega is the same exact thing as selling any financial vehicle or selling anything. It's the same f-ing thing, right? It's the same core principles. Just download the info and then find out, obviously download the info of the actual item and then understand who our target is and just bridge the gap. It's actually not that hard. Like I pour a pour a drink and and you know be be a person for a change, you know? And uh, it's 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 very easy. It was very very easy for me. So h- how do you how do you understand the the target audience? So I guess but first to kind of summarize what you said so far, you basically started you happened upon this niche that turns out a lot of, you know, wealthier people or people in power and people in, you know, high positions end up coming to you or, or partnering with you or finding you through this niche because it is, you know, it attracts a certain demographic. And then you realize like, oh, all these things I'm doing to get to these people, I can use it to sell to other people in other industries that have a much higher return on my time. You know, think about it. I connected with a you know major American insurance company because they're one of their directors liked a video I made about Omega. Right. So we just start chatting. And then once we were comfortable enough, I said, you know, 
I know you like that commercial a lot that we made for Omega. You know, we do that for other companies, right? We know we do that outside of watches. And he was like, no, I didn't know that. And and of course he didn't know that because it wasn't even true. I, I've, you know, it's just not true. I wasn't doing it for other people. I wasn't, no one wants to be the first, you know, but, uh, but you know, they were one of the first by accident. They didn't know it. Um, but I said, yeah, we, it's, it's, we do it. We do it for other clients all the time, you know, outside of watches. And they were like, fuck yeah, that'd be amazing. Let's do, let's do it. Let's go. And that was just the beginning of the last year. So and Theo and Harris then was Theo and Harris was a, a a watch retailer, but you had made that had gotten you to a position where you can make videos for like larger watch companies, correct? Exactly, which is extremely unique. There's only one other company in our space that that has gotten to a point that can do that. Uh, they are much larger than we are. They're the industry leader. They're they're a huge company. They're very well funded. You know, they're they're incredible. Um, but uh, but yeah, we I, you know started selling vintage watches, then started to make friends at the brands and saying, hey, the same way that I can sell my vintage Rolex, I could sell your new Omega or your new Cartier or your new whatever. And uh, because because our company had a larger shadow. Like Theo and Harris has always been, you know, I don't even have an office, right? We work out of, you know, my apartment. We have like five employees. Work, everyone works out of their own place. And uh, it's very, you know, it's very kind of ragtag in that way. Um, but we operate kind of on a, on a much more professional kind of level, you know. So the big brands had no problem with it. Yeah, they were like, yeah, let's, let's make commercials. You know, let's make commercials. So how did you get to the point from not really knowing too much about watches to then reading up about them? And then you were in school, I believe. Um and you were, I think you were going to be a lawyer and then you all of a sudden had this gift for storytelling. How did you get so good that these brands were willing to take a chance on you? Yeah. So I, I always wanted to be an attorney. I still love the law. I read a lot about the law. It's like a hobby, I guess now, which is kind of a weird hobby. Um, <laughs> but I'm not an attorney. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the medium version of a long story is, you know, I, I come from a, like a, I mean, I grew up middle class, but like, you know, right before that, everyone was very, very poor, you know, it's a very, very lower class background. And, um, and the idea of having a lawyer in the family was quite of a cool idea for my family. They were like, wow, we, you know, if we have a lawyer as a grandson, we really did it, you know? And, uh, I did some internships. I did an internship rather. And I realized over that summer that this was not for me. I love the law, but I hated, I hated the journey that you needed to kind of suck it up and go through to become a successful attorney in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. You know, you really needed to sell a firm, you know, your, your two decades at a minimum, you needed to sell them, you know, 23 to 53, you know, or 43 rather, you needed to sell. Them. Uh, and, and then even at 43, you still weren't, you still were owned. You were just making more money then, you know? So I just, I don't know. I, I suppose that I, I realized pretty young that, it wasn't just the money that makes you successful. It's freedom, you know? And I said, okay, I've got to figure out a different way here. I can't, I can't go to law school. I can't do this. I can't do it. Right. No, that, that sounds really cool. So, so for you, the motivating factor here was freedom, as you mentioned, right? Oh, for sure. Uh, well, yeah. Was that the driving factor for every decision trying to come out of like this quote unquote nine to five or in your case, nine to nine <laughs> yeah. um, law path? It was definitely freedom to begin with. I mean, when I when I made my choice, which was alone, I mean, my parents were very angry. Um, I I sat down with a pen and paper and I wrote down kind of a very very you know comprehensive pro con list and it very like very detailed you know, and uh, next to the, the on the financial portion of this divergent path of this entrepreneurship path, the you know, the number that I wrote for you know what I. You know, all my assumptions had to be based off of that I was going to make sixty-five thousand dollars. That was it. So that, that you know, this this you know, this this has to make sense, even if I only make sixty-five thousand dollars in perpetuity, mm. right? Because I had no concept of money. Mm. So I said, "This is you no, know, this is it. This is it." And if it doesn't work at sixty-five, then it doesn't work. And I still chose full well, only believing I'd ever make sixty-five thousand dollars a year to uh, to pursue the the, the free path. Which is uh, that's kind of cool. In retrospect, that's kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this goes back to something we said in, our, in our, one of our first podcasts, which is like entrepreneurs are optimists, but they're also very, very calculated optimists. And it sounds like you know you made conservative estimates. You weren't like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to you know stop law school, and I'm just going to make a million dollars by the end of this year, right? I mean, you can have that approach, but when you're making such a big decision, it's always I would say better to err on the side of caution. Um, and I mean, in a way. 
staying in school and like taking on student debt and all that stuff would probably just set you in such a big hole. I wonder like how did you calculate like how long it would take for those to reach each other? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I we I knew starting salaries with the with with, the, with law. I, I knew kind of everything. I mean, again, you know, barring you know, barring disaster, you kind of have a good understanding of what your next twenty years looks like. Uh, yeah, I kind of had a pretty good picture of it. You know, I did, and I I was conservative. But you know, it's funny. You know, now the business has been doing well now for probably like four years, like really well for four years, and. Uh, I've met a lot of the same way that I've met a lot of, you know, um, uh, executives that have given me some of their budgets and stuff like that, because we we spend it really, really well. Uh, we're really, really a great partner. Um, I've also met a lot of people in business, in corporate, in corporate you know, world that fancy themselves entrepreneurs. And when they and they're, and they're not, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all, obviously. And but what's funny is they all sound the same when, when they're looking, when they're sharing their harebrained scheme and their numbers are so astronomically large because they've never actually dealt in business on their own before. They've never actually brought something to market. You know, they were they were they were charged, you know, like in pharmaceuticals is a good example. Right. Uh, I grew up in pharmaceuticals. My, my dad's in pharmaceuticals. And I really like that's a whole separate story. But I really grew up in pharma. Right. And uh, I would hear these guys, these mid-level managers, which is a beautiful thing. That's what my dad was, mid-level manager. Right. But they would they would talk as if they were, you know, the Rockefellers. Right. They would talk. I'm bringing this brand to market. And I was like, well, it kind of you're babysitting it to market. You know, someone else developed it. Someone else funded it. Someone else is actually bringing these, the, 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 the product to the doctors, to the end client. You're just, you know, you're the babysitter. What the f*** are you talking about? You know, um, but that's how, that's how a lot of corporate guys speak in my experience. But I'm the exact opposite. I'm always like, okay, let's undershoot our projections super low. Let's, you know, relatively speaking, um, let's, you know, let's overestimate the workload and if it makes sense, even then, let's go, you know? Wow, that's some really great advice because, I mean, it, it's not just applicable to, to any given, I mean, it's applicable to any given situation, right? Uh, be conservative with your estimates. I do that even in finance myself. Um, I always tell, I always tell um, my community, hey, make sure your estimates are conservative, make sure they make sense, right? When you're tackling any sort of business, are you able to execute? Are you able to reiterate? And then are you able to basically improve your product, right? So uh, being, being in that business mindset is, is a really, really strong thing. Yeah, so, how, so to go back to, to one of the earlier questions, which really piqued my interest is, how do you find your target or understand your target audience, right? You said, you know, pour a drink, be human. Um, but of course there is a bit more of a formulaic way, I would assume. There, there is. And that's actually one of our big kind of like differentiators next to the other agencies that we pitch against, right? It's, 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 it's two differentiators. And number one is exactly that. It's a formulaic approach to, to methodology. And a lot of these creative agencies, creative agencies by and large are owned by two sorts of people. Um, or owned and operated by two sorts of people. One, the artist that the, the artist that doesn't have the, I don't know, the um, they, they, they just can't they just can't live like a starving artist, right? The, the artist that doesn't have the, you know, the, the dream of living like La Boheme and getting hepatitis, you know, in the basement, and you know, <laughs> they, 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 they check it out and they go and they try to sell their compromised artwork for money. Right. It's not, it's not their real art. It's their compromised version. And they have no idea how to actually mm. sell something. Now, they can make something really beautiful, but beauty is just a tactic. It's not a solution. Right. Now, on the other side of the token, you've got the business guys that know that they can make a ton of money selling creative. Right. But in the same way, they have no f <laughs> idea how to actually make something creative. So in many ways, my job so far in business development is easy because my competition is a joke. You know, you've either got the moron that doesn't know how to actually like do anything but art that's trying to sell something much larger. And then you've got the business guy who very simply is all buzzwords, right? These guys are all about, you know, these guys are all about uh, buzzwords. So the pitches are a joke. Yeah, it's, it's a joke. Got it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we like to give our, our listeners frameworks because a lot of them are likely working on their own startups and stuff. So sometimes they might struggle with messaging or finding their target audience or like creating a video or a creative or an ad that really 
hits or triggers an emotion or hits a nerve. And to do that, you really have to know your audience well. So you're saying you you cover insurance, you cover watches, you cover financial vehicles. So how, you know, say, say I said, okay, I have XYZ product that I would like you to help us sell. Um, what questions would you be asking me to figure out how to reach and how to connect with our target demo? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a simple conversation. You, and you have to, I look at it very much like a like a, an attorney-client relationship where if you're gonna, you, you gotta be honest with me, right? If you can't be honest with me, I can't go there and trick everybody else, right? I mean, that's kind of how it is. So what are the strengths, like what, what, what are they? What are the weaknesses? What are we working with here, dude? You know, did you kill the guy or didn't you? I gotta know, I, I, I gotta know, you know? And sometimes, sometimes the product has fleas. Oftentimes it does have fleas. You know, and, and we have to know that. Otherwise, we just we can't we can over speak. We can overwrite something. And now you're going to find yourself in a bit of a pickle with with uh, with regulation. There's a lot of stuff like that. You know, so really, it's a matter of having a, a truly honest conversation uh, with the client from day one about their actual advantages and the actual disadvantages of their product and their company. Right. Just fact based going mm -hmm. from there. I say, OK, now what about the personality? Right. What, for, for example, right. Um, marketing. We do a lot of work with the PGA Tour. Marketing for the PGA Tour. Um, it's very difficult, but in concept, it's very easy because their messaging is, is so different than other major league sports. Right. They are so family driven and the others just really aren't right. And their entire structure uh, is the opposite. Right. You can walk on a, a PGA Tour course and you can be right next to your favorite pro for a hundred bucks a hundred dollars when's the last time you took your nephew to a baseball game and didn't spend eight hundred dollars you know i mean it's disgusting it really it really is so that's their that's their you know that's their uh uh, uh, uh it's an advantage now disadvantage is for newcomers and they're looking to grow golf is not an easy sport to watch because you are moving around fucking constantly and it's very confusing and it's very difficult right and if they can't admit that to me you know what are we doing here you know, so now we can't really avoid the fact that it is a very active sport and a lot of people aren't interested in that. We have to romanticize the idea of chasing the ball, the idea of being an active member, the idea of, uh, you know, everyone has equal claim to a front row. You've got to reposition that, you know, so it's very simple. It's, it's downloading all the facts. And then, uh, and then just, I guess, I don't know. I, it's not spinning it. It's looking for it's, it's looking at what's beautiful within them that other people aren't necessarily seeing. It's not, it's not a lie. It's just, it's the right angle. Right. Instead of, you know, you, you basically took a con and then said, you know, it's okay if you don't want to do that, but then you made it an extreme, like positive for people who do want to do it. Exactly. A, a good analogy would be, you know, it's not catfishing, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, uh faking what you look like. It's a woman you've seen that's absolutely beautiful, right? In any light, but when you put her in the right light, she's just incredible. Like she'll take your breath away, right? Like that's it. You know, that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's not catfishing. It's just putting it in the right light. So how did you learn how to do that? Because I think there's a certain way of thinking. Is it just innate for you or was it a matter of iterating on so many different projects? I think on a, on a level, on a level, it's innate, you know, I, again, I studied, I studied law. I mean, I, I went to college, you know, preparing for the LSAT and I mean, my major was religion, right? I'm not even a religious guy, but the, but religion was the second highest uh, scoring uh, major for your LSAT. Right. So I, I'm a, and I know religion, it's a funny, it's a funny thing, but it, it, it does, it's, it's kind of oxymoronic, but it does teach a, a method of critical thinking. It actually is very difficult to understand the, the original, like, you know, writers of, not of the books, but of the reactionary books and the, the mm -hmm. papal encyclicals. Again, I'm not getting religious because I'm not, but it is very difficult, right? So if, if you train your, I think if you train yourself to be able to grasp a lot of information and really synthesize it and categorize it and organize it, you are just better off in anything, I think, you know, better off in anything. So far as actually being kind of like poetic and stuff like that, I don't know, not that much. I mean, I watched a lot of movies growing up and I listened, I watched all of the Anthony Bourdain episodes that ever came out. And that was it. That's, that's how I learned to write, I think. That's why a lot of my shit sounds like Anthony Bourdain because it's not stolen. It's just when you grow up hearing that one voice so often, you know, I mean, how do you shake it? How do you shake mm. it? Got it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're basically... You're, you're, it's like a, what would you say? Two birds, one stone. Like you're creating an ad for your client, but it's also an ad for your, 
your company, which is pretty cool. <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> That's pretty exactly cool. right. Yeah. And then so far as LMF is concerned, I mean, I really only work on three sorts of projects. Um, one would be, or there's only three reasons I say yes. It, one, if the brand is so large that strategically it just makes sense. And, you know, you know, when FedEx calls to do a commercial, I'm going to do it. Even if the commercial is, uh, even if the concept is not great, and even if the pay isn't great, it's FedEx. So you just do it. You know, mm -hmm. the other is if a, a client is just paying full freight. I mean, just, just they're paying too, you know, not too much, but they're paying a, a, a lot of money. You say, okay, I'm going to do that project. And then the third is uh, a project that you're just particularly just really stoked about, really, really excited about. You know, I mean, and then sometimes multiple of those line up and it's great. Sometimes the ones you're excited about are paying great and, and all that stuff. But, um, but they don't necessarily have to, you know. Yeah, no, it sounds like you've built up this like product and business empire of things that are self-sustaining. And, and you're at this point where you have the liberty and the freedom to choose which projects you want to like search after. Right. And that it, it's it's amazing. Right. Um, and so I, I want to ask you uh, the days before you have found this version of success and freedom. What was it like reiterating on a product that you were creating? Right. Obviously, I would assume you didn't just like come out the gate having this entire suite and optionality of doing whatever you liked. Um, do you have any lessons and advice for reading and refining your product? Yeah, uh, of, of course. I mean, I, I think that going kind of going back to the days even before I started LMF, maybe a year before, because I started LMF uh, basically uh, six months into COVID. Right, which is hysterical. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like what, a, what an odd thing to decide to do. But that's what I did, right? So uh, I suppose a year before that, when the idea was beginning to kind of come about, like maybe I should really start using these skills elsewhere and, and, and make a lot more money doing them. Um, um, my only mentor, I suppose, uh, who's a very, you know, he's a super successful guy, very, very, very generous with his time with me. It's amazing. We're actually really good friends now. He said to me, okay, great. So you know how to, you know how to sell things that kind of, and you do sell them great, but you know how to sell things that sell themselves. You sell vintage Rolex. It sells itself too. Don't, you know, don't think too much of yourself. And I said, okay, good point. Good point. And he said, what else could you sell? And I gave him the thing. Well, I could, you know, it's anything. It's not even being kind. So it's, they're all, it's all the same thing. It's the same equation. And he goes, no. F okay. He goes, what if one, you know, when I, he was talking about maybe hooking me up with one of his clients. He goes, let's say Levi's for instance. Right. You want Levi's to give you the 501, right? Because the 501 is what you wear and it's the cut that you just fucking love. Right. But they're not going to give you that. They're just not right. Cause they, they're going to give that to the top agency. They're going to give you their dog. They're going to give you their most polarizing thing. That's totally back burner. They're probably C-suite won't even see it, it doesn't matter. Right. But how can you create an impactful piece on something that, um, it just really, it just, it, objectively speaking, it's not going to resonate with the audience. It's not going to be that, it's nothing about it's going to be that great. He goes, so until you're ready, you know, to, until you're in a sp space where you can actually, you know, in three days, put together a commercial, I mean, not produce it, but put together the entire concept, get everything done in, you know, in, in preparation, uh, all the, all the narrative until you're ready to do that in three days for a dog, you're just not ready. You know, and I was like, okay, well that, you know, that took me down from my high for sure. Um, um, but he, but he was right. Uh, he, he, he was right. And I think that more people need to expect that. And like we said before about managing expectations and being conservative, um, that's part of it. It's, it's, it's about the money, but it's also about the actual project. You know, you're not going to get great projects. What are the f odds you're going to be able to give it an, you're going to be given an opportunity for a, a huge company with a fantastic product. You're just not going to get it. You know, so again, it goes back to really refining your skill set, you know, which I think is, you know, everyone ought to do more often. I think that I don't find people being very well rounded in general. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's just refining your skill set. It, it, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah. And I think that that kind of lends itself to a concept I read about recently called random reinforcement, where it wasn't necessarily random, but sometimes like, it's often used in, in terms of day trading, like random events or random like spikes will cause you to make you feel like you're incredible at what you're doing and you're an amazing day trader, but it was random. And then now it gives you that false confidence. And it sounds like your mentor was able to kind of point it out and be like, you know, you're doing great, but you're also selling Rolex. <laughs> it's not too hard to sell. <laughs> right. That's so, it's just so important. You know, I think that's, 
it's so it's it's so the opposite of I think what we just see in in culture in general now. I just think that that's it's it's antithetical. But it's a but it's a it's a it's a forever truth. My right? people are oh yeah, it's it's never as good as it seems. And I get that all the time. We signed a tremendous deal a month ago, and I remember you know my dad and I are really close, and uh, you know we had a beautiful moment, beautiful night. It was great. We had great wine and made some food. It was awesome. An amazing night. Hugs. It was beautiful. And then in the morning, I was like, okay, like that was, that was, all, it was kind of luck. I mean, you know, there was a lot of luck involved <laughs> there. I mean, you know, yeah, do we deserve it? Yes. Are we going to kill it? Yes. But a lot of other guys deserved it too and, and would have killed it too. And mm-hmm. uh, sometimes you get fucking lucky. You get fucking yeah. lucky too. And you, you can't let it, you know, my dad always said, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't buy your own right? Uh, you, know, you know what you are, know what you're not. And of course, you're always going to pitch yourself a little bit better than that, of course. But you better remember that that's not true. You know, because mm. as soon as you start to buy your own buddy, it's all over. And he was I, he, I think he should have waited till after I was seven to tell me that. But, but he was <laughs> right. Yeah, my, uh, my PE teacher, when we're doing push ups, he would say, if you cheat, you cheat yourself, you know, which I think is a similar concept. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you guys you guys have really dialed it in. Um, and and just to reiterate and summarize everything that I feel like we've gotten value out of, um, it's basically focus on the things that you guys know are your weaknesses, right? Uh, figure out how to sell the thing that's unsellable. Become really good at putting together this framework and having a plan to then execute and go out there and kill it, right? Being uncomfortable, sorry, being comfortable with what you're uncomfortable with. Ah, that's a tongue twister. Um, and, and really and really going back in there and, and being able to just put it all together and, and run with it, right? So once you can do that, you're, you're, just, you're just on the path to like a better product, a better version of you to tackle the challenges that you're going to face in the future. You're, you're exactly right. I think that one of... Uh, I started I started making commercials and watches in October or November of 2020, I believe. Nice. And uh, yeah, 2020. And um, uh, my third project, I think, which I don't even I think it was for free. I think I pitched it for no money. Uh, I specifically went and pitched a watch company that was entirely unlikable. No one gave it. And I'll, show, I'll send you the commercial after this. I mean, n- n- I mean, everyone kind of dislikes the company. They kind of laugh at the company because it's so foolish. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not um, – it. the idea, the concept of the company is cool, but it's so ornate and it's so just not of today completely. You know, and the whole purpose was, and the commercial was great. People loved it. Would read the comments; it was incredible. Uh, and the purpose was not to make that company happy. I don't care about them. They'll never do anything for me. Not really. Um, but the purpose was, in a future meeting with Omega, who everyone wants, and they kind of say the question, like, "Well, you know, what can you sell?" I'll say, "You ever hear of Jacques Adreau? And they'll say, "Yeah." And I'll say, "Yeah." Like no one wants them, right? I'm like, "Yes." Yeah. So, so we'd agree that, that, yeah, watch this commercial, and they're like. That's cool. You did it. You know, what can you sell? And I said, well, if we can, you know, show you that we could sell the, the dog, meaning Jacques Adreau, this other company. I said, then, then we can sell you, right? Like we could, we could, we could sell the moon watch if we've already shown it. And they were like, wait, you sold Jacques Adreau? And I was like, yeah. I said, nobody can sell that. I said, oh, yeah, you know, well, we, we did, you know? But I think that the, the most important lesson I think there or the most like tactful kind of piece of advice there is, um, Again, saying you can do it, even if you can, nobody wants to be the guy that bought the unproven product from the young, from the new guy. You know, it's just too much of a risk. It's just too much of a risk. You know, so so going out there and building a portfolio, if you're in a service, if you're in a service, you know, capacity, right? Building a portfolio is so important. Even if you do it for free, who cares? You know, it doesn't matter. But that you know, doing that project allowed us to open up a relationship with one of the biggest watch brands in the world. You know, if I didn't tell them I could sell Jack and Drew, I showed it to them. You know, I mean, that's I think that's very important. Yeah, I think it really comes down to like a few things. It's it's make it's reducing their downside, just like you said. Like they're like, okay, if you can sell a product that's we th- we believe is not quite up to our standard, then there's no way you can't sell ours because ours is only going to be easier to sell. So you're creating 
limited downside for them and pretty much only upside. And then you're also making your product bulletproof to the fact that, you know, this is the weakest thing or this is the biggest thing that you could nitpick us for. And we already proved that it's not an issue for us. And then I think the third thing is making sure that your product is not giving you the wrong signals where you might think that, you know, or another business person might think like, oh, well, our company's killing it. It's crushing it. What comes to mind for me is, is actually cryptocurrency uh, projects where you think you found product market fit or you think you have this amazing product, but it's really something else that's making it sell when you think it's this other thing. And that's going to bite you when, if you don't realize that. So the reason why I bring up like crypto projects is because a lot of them ha have financial incentives behind them. So it's my belief that the, everyone says 98% of these projects are going to fail, blah, blah, blah. But not many people say why. I think a big reason why is because they haven't actually found product market fit, but it feels like they have because everyone's just participating in these projects to like earn money, to earn these staking rewards or to earn these financial incentives. And the second that dries up, they're going to realize, oh crap, our product wasn't why people were here. It was because of the incentives we gave them. And so for you, it, you were like, oh crap, it might not have been a commercials. It might have just been the Rolex, but then you basically eliminated that concern. Anyone, no matter what you do, but especially if you're an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, like uh, that whole you know idea of like not being able to sleep. I, I sleep just fine, um, but that idea of like um, always wondering when it's kind of going to you know when you're going to hit your ceiling. You know, we're always wondering like, well, it's I'm not it's not there, but it's only six months away. You know, and, and that ceiling doesn't have to even necessarily, it's not necessarily of size. It could just be, or, or of capacity. It could just be, I'm not qualified for that project. And that's the one I really want. So it's a matter of in your downtime or when you, know, when you mm -hmm. can, way ahead of the game, you know, just pr like prepare for that, anticipate that, answer that question for them now. So when they do ask, you know, you're not standing there with your in your hands, you know, I mean, that's. No, that's it. I think that's an old Italian saying. I don't know if that really that's cross culturally applies. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know that's 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 what I think. You know. So can I ask you was was your goal to, was it a goal for you guys to score Omega and how did you go, come across doing that? Like was it planned from the beginning? So so COVID happened. Um, I I only had. I had one full-time employee, uh, two two more part-time, but one full-time employee, and uh, who was employee like number one at the company, and uh, and she she left during COVID, right? So I said, okay, throwing a curveball here, okay, what the fuck, you know how? And I I can't edit videos, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. So here I am thinking like, okay, this is, you know, I laid down in my bed and I took a breath and I said, okay, this is this is like where you you choose whether you're a, a boy or a man. This is one of those moments, right? You either need to, you know, this is an opportunity, you have to really scale up and double your size and become really, really that much better. Or, you know, kind of admit that it was always a fluke uh, and then you, you were never as good as you thought. Naturally, I chose the former, you know? And uh, I said, okay, let's get, into, let's get into this commercial stuff. Let's get into it, which was extremely hard during COVID because no one was even meeting. How, how do you make a commercial if you can't meet with the brand? What's the plan? Well, I need to get some of the small brands in order to get the big brand. But I know that once I get one big brand, I can push all the other big brands, you know, and that's it. So Omega was that first target big brand. So again, I pitched all the small brands. I got them, which was nothing. I mean, it was a joke. It was taking a loss. And even the projects I build for, it was a joke. You know, I was building them $4,000 for a commercial. I mean, that's it's horrible. It's just it's horrible. You know, it's embarrassing. Um, but um but then I made Omega a free commercial. All I asked for was the watch. I didn't even tell them I was making them a commercial. I said, hey, can you send me over a watch? We do reviews. Total false pretenses. I get the watch. I produce a commercial. The commercial wasn't even that good. It, you know, it's, it, it, it was, I, I, you know, they loved it though. It was, it, you know, they, they loved it. And uh, they, they called me up and they were like, what the fuck? Who were like, what? What was that? Like, that was, that was incredible. You know, and I said, yeah, well, I didn't want to really pitch you guys a commercial. I don't want to go through like billing and accounts payable. I wanted to reduce all of the amounts of, you know, all the speed bumps. I wanted to eliminate them. So I made a few guys for free. Get me, get me back on the next one. And they were like, okay, cool. When's the next one? Can we have another now? You know? And then that was it. I mean, from then on open, it was floodgates open and they were like one of our best, best partners. You know, they were our best, one of our best partners. Mm, got it. 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a you know pretty logical roadmap. You know, do it for free. Um, basically, put in the sweat equity um, and get the small people. You know, eliminate your dogs or prove that you can sell the dogs and then go to Omega. Yeah, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I guess another question is, what what does this all look like for you in in five years? You know, I ask myself that too, and. I'd say for the first time, for the first time in my like life, I guess, um, structurally, no different structurally, you know, uh, which is a weird thing to say, cause I've never felt that way. Never. Um, but, um, TNH, LMF, more exciting projects, larger clients, more money, not, I wouldn't even, I don't even necessarily want to scale size wise. I don't even necessarily want to. Um, I don't even want more, like a lot more employees. I really don't. Uh, I don't want to take on that many more projects. You know, I'm, I'm not one of those guys that's shooting for a billion dollars, or I'm not one of those guys looking to raise 10 million for evaluation on a, you know, to, to, to scale a company. I don't care about that. I, I just don't care. I'm a, I, you know, I am the definition of a small businessman. Like, like, li- like literally, you know, there are, there are millions of dollars a year to be made in small business. And that is just fine by me. That is just fine. I, I honestly am kind of right there with you. Like, I think, you know, every entrepreneur or not every, but a lot of entrepreneurs are like, oh, I'm building the next unicorn. I'm building the next billion dollar company. Right. Okay. Good yeah. Luck. I mean, it's it, one, first of all, it's like super, super hard. But second of all, like, you know, it depends on your goals. Like for me, I want freedom. It's something that you said you wanted as well, Nick, you know, I'm Nick, what are your goals? Like, why would you want to be, I guess, an entrepreneur? I mean, I feel as if there's a lot of control and impact that you might have in your life, right? I'm sure you might have done this yourself, uh, Christian, when when you feel like, okay, law school isn't for me. I'm not working for somebody else for the next 50 years or 20 years. And then when I'm 53 or 43, I'm still working for somebody else, right? And I think that that resonates with a lot of people. It's, It's more about just being able to have an impact while also having control of what you do and how you put it out there, right? So I think that's the really attractive lesson about entrepreneurship and this whole discussion that we've had today uh, with Christian. Yeah, and so that could be a reason, and you can still do everything that we mentioned without creating a billion dollar company. And I, I would maybe consider it a lifestyle company where you know it makes you enough where you can live how you want to live, live by design, as they often say. Um, and it sounds like you're right in that zone. You're cruising. You're you're in your space. You know you're um maybe even in flow and and that's awesome i think that's that's the dream for a lot of people i think it's a matter of again back to you know back to um uh uh, conservative estimates and and back to um being i think self-aware is is a lot to do with it you know uh i i think that you know i'm probably we're all probably capable of, of of actually achieving more than our goals financially speaking Right, we probably, you know, probably could could in theory do mm. it. Do I do I do I want to do that? You know, or do I really not? I, I think money f- little kids anyway. <laughs> so you know, how, how rich do my kids need yeah. to be? You know, it's silly. You know, I mean, it's it's it, I don't know. It doesn't. It's really not that important to me. You know, and you look at all these people, you know, out there on you know on YouTube and shit like that, and you know, like when when is it enough? And and. If you've been a bystander for long enough, you see a lot of their lives start to fall apart. You know, it's it's f***ed up. Again, if you've been a bystander for, for a long period of time, you kind of know the, not just the shtick, but you actually know what's going on behind. It gets sad as shit after a while. It's like, you know, I'm good. I'm good. You guys, you guys have all of it. I'll just, I'll have this. I'm, I'm believe me, I'm. Yeah, you're I'm you're building good. your own work-life balance more so than anything else, essentially yeah yeah literally literally which and i mean after like a certain point like you said the amount of money the differences to your life is probably like marginal it's like it's like not that much and then i don't know i've i've been watching um i don't know if you heard of alex hormozy okay so he's um they call him like the hundred million dollar man or like 60 million dollar man he's uh he's a say he's like nihilist uh as like his philosophy nihilism um and he's basically like you know, when you when we all pass on, the money just goes back into the game, and odds are it won't be in your families like you know four or five generations from now. So, like, why 
why spend your time when you've already like made it made it to the point where you can be okay and be comfortable continuing to like push yourself to that limit when ultimately it's all just like not quite going to matter a few generations from now. And that can still, you know, maybe that is what fulfills you is like striving towards that goal. And that's okay. But I think there's a larger percentage of people who are like stressing about how they're going to get to a billion dollars. than there are the percentage of people who actually that's, feels like their true calling is a billion dollars. I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, the idea of the idea, again, I, 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 I do not have a family. I, I do not have children. I'm not married. I'm not engaged or anything like that. But I, I'm definitely a family man. And I, I look forward to one day maybe having a family if I'm so lucky. You know? and, and I just keep, I've always thought about like this idea of, you know, my grandfather was a cab driver in New York City. He was never home never home and he never made really any money, right? It's kind of, you know, kind of, kind of you know, that's just what it is. You know, you work really hard, you don't make a lot of money. And I, I, you know, I remember, I can imagine my mom growing up knowing that dad wasn't home and that's just fine because dad's not home because you need to pay for college because he wants you to have a better life. I get that. That's sacrifice, right? But when dad's not home and we have four houses, why isn't dad home? It's, it's because dad's being selfish right? It's because dad puts his ego before you. That's what it is. I mean, sugarcoat it all you want, look at it wherever you want, but that's what it is, right? Uh, I, have, I, have a, I have a friend that's an attorney uh, in Connecticut, uh, relatively middle-class background. He has a ton of money now by accident, really, uh, but, um, but he's a great attorney. And, and, and if he didn't have all that money, he would have actually gone on to become a very famous attorney, but he got lazy once he had all the money. Uh, but but he, 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 he said, you know, the only cases he takes on now are family practice cases in his neighborhood, not for money, but because he finds it so incredibly interesting that and he lives in a very wealthy Connecticut neighborhood. And he says that um, uh, a, a, a broken home or rather, you know, absentee parent is an absentee parent. And whether it's because they're doing crack or because they're in Vienna for the weekend, the child still has the same lack of a parent. And that's it. Right. And I definitely feel that, you know, I, I had a very loving family, you know, but, but again, thinking about these kids, these imaginary children that I may have or may not have one day, I just keep thinking about like, like, why wouldn't I be there? Remind me. Why, why, because I'm, because I'm going to make more money for, to, to buy what, for what? It's so, it's, I don't know, but that's, I, that's a, I guess that's just more of like a, like a life philosophy and there's business advice, but I think the two go hand in hand in, in many ways. Matt, but I think, I think your life philosophy has, has a lot to do with how you view the world and you, you, especially yourself, you come off to me for, for the past, I, I guess, 45 minutes that we're to be talking now as a very, very good entrepreneur salesman marketer right you're really well spoken and you have the strong like business acumen to like push it uh and and become more successful and reach that billion dollar mark if you wanted to right but then at, at some point you you got to think to yourself where's the balance in my life right and and the philosophies and how you were raised um and how like the, your family surrounding you and building up that environment from where you grew from, right? That That's basically at the end goal for me, at least, how you pay back your surroundings, right? Having something bigger than money, bigger than you and working towards that and what is your impact towards that, right? It's it's not at the end of the day, I'm 100% I'm in agreement with you. It's not just about me. It's about when I'm on my deathbed, who's around me, right? I hope there's family and I hope there's close friends. And, and at the end of the day, like you, like, like you guys said, um, money's like Matt said, money's not going to be there when you're dead, right? It's just going to move on to your family and hopefully it stays there. So build those relationships and, and really, really treasure those moments. Yeah. You're exactly right. And before, when I was talking about the whole law school thing, I gave you guys the really abridged version, but there's one anecdote that I think really ultimately played a big role in my decision and kind of how I got to this kind of philosophy in life. And it was, it was the day that I categorically decided that I wasn't going to law school, <laughs> actually. Uh, and it was a Friday. Wow. Um, and I had Chinese food later that night with my dad. I'll never forget it, it was yesterday, right? Uh, anyway, um, it was a Friday and we were told to stay late. And that's fine. I don't really care. I didn't really have a problem with working, whatever. It, it, 
it wasn't the biggest deal in the world. But they asked us to, well, it was not they, it was one of the partners. And, and the firm that I worked at, they were very transparent with, with pay. So the, the partners were making no less than $3 million a year, right? So they were, they were doing really well. They're, they're, you know, they're doing really well. This wasn't a rinky-dink New Jersey law firm. This was a major New York City law firm, right? So the partners are making $3 million uh, at, a, at a minimum. And this was an older partner. He was in his early 60s, right? Maybe even mid-60s. And uh, he was a miserable mother. Oh my God. And I remember, I, I knew where he lived because we all, we all knew it. He lived in New Canaan or New Canaan, Connecticut, right? And a car would pick him up every day to go to work, a, a big, big S class. It was gorgeous, right? And, and as soon as the day was over, it would pick him up and bring him back home, right? And uh, I remember he was the one that assigned us this task at 5 p.m. He assigned it. So we would be there till eight to recategorize the library. And I remember thinking to myself, because like someone else told me that we had to do it. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, what a prick. He's a miserable guy. He wants us to see whatever. Maybe he's teaching us a lesson. He wants us to get used to. Fine. I can get over that. He stayed. He stood there. He stood there. He, from, from five to eight, he stood there being a curmudgeon and, uh, and, and, and watching us, you know, and, and just, and it was, it was nonsense. It was total, it was, it was not even a real task. And I remember thinking to myself as I'm filing these books, this guy makes $3 million a year, got a beautiful mansion in Connecticut. Why the f would he want to be here, <laughs> you know, on the east side of Manhattan at 5.30 or 8 o'clock on a Friday? Shouldn't he want to be home with his family and his beautiful wife and his children and all of his money? Or, and now, now, now I'm going off on the storytelling, now I'm thinking about like now I'm developing a story in my head, or... Is he only in this position because he put his entire life into work and in turn burned his relationship in theory with his whole family? And now this is his home, mm, man. Right. And I got home that day and I told my dad, hey, dad, because my mom and I weren't speaking at that, at that time. My mom and I didn't speak for like a year when I wasn't going to law school. And I said to my dad, I said, uh, dad, by the way, uh, you handle this or I handle this, but I'm not going. And that's the end of the conversation. And he looked at me and he was like, all right, pal, I guess, I guess you're not going. Wow. That was it. Yeah. Weird. Wow. No, that was super powerful yeah, stuff. I would, yeah. Powerful story. Yeah. Cool. Oh, man. <laughs> I got something to do. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think everybody yeah. does. Uh, that, mis that miserable prick's probably gonna have a heart attack next month. Poor guy. Oh, I, man. Feel bad. I feel bad that I'm shitting on him, but it's true. He taught me a good lesson, I guess. Oh. But, uh, oh man, yeah, I, I guess, uh, to kind of wrap up the philosophy and tie it a bit back to business as well. I think this has been a really helpful conversation just for life in general. But, uh, one quote that I had seen, uh, from a piece about you said, be self-aware, be fast and be happy. So do you want to, do you want to touch on that? Yeah. You know, again, back to self-awareness in general, even business aside, I, you know, <laughs> It's just so important. I don't understand these people how they're not. It's just it's just amazing, and you see it in the you see it everywhere. Whether your friends or in the news, it's just it, it, no one's no one's self aware anymore. It, it's it's amazing, and you're only able to make good decisions and informed decisions and fast decisions if you actually know the facts. And you got to know facts in part about yourself. You know, am I actually uh, go? Not can I do this? Am I going to? You know, and, and that's why people all the time. I could I could do that. Right. But are you going, are you going to see it through? And if you're not going to, why start? You know, sometimes the best business businesses are the ones you don't start. I hear all the people all the time. Everyone's got a fucking idea. Yeah, it could work, but are you going to do it? No. So stop, cut it out, you know, put it on the shelf. You know, I see that a lot, you know, and then as far as being fast, what's the old quote? Like uh, wrong decisions better than indecision. I, I mean, that's right. But I tend to think that just in general, you're going to be making, generally speaking, good decisions. If you're informed and you are a semi-intelligent person, just the speed is going to be such an advantage to you, especially if you're in a small business, because the big businesses, it's, a, it's like moving a ship, right? It's like turning a ship sometimes. So it's, you know, I don't know if you guys are car fans, but when you see these different, you know, Porsches on the track, sometimes the faster ones, right, aren't even the ones that are winning, right? It's the ones that are more agile in the corners. Right. I mean, it, it's 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 exactly true. And that's got a lot to do with why we ended up doing very well, you know, and then be happy is obviously my entire motto. It's just like it's I don't care how much money I make in some months. If, if it's if I'm not happy, it, it, feel, it felt like and I'm just, you know, it's just horrible. I don't feel successful at all. Wow. 
I love that analogy yeah. of the the ship and the Porsches. I I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I just um, made it up actually. I think it's <laughs> I, I, it's kind that's of uh, that's pretty yeah, good. I like funny. it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, okay. Well, I think that is uh, Nick. Unless you have anything else, I think that's a solid point to to leave the podcast and jump into our uh, our lightning round. All right, so Christian, uh, we ask every single guest a list of seven questions, Ooh. the same seven questions. Your goal is to answer it in one to three words for each question. We're just gonna go boom, 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 boom. But first, what do you want to share with the audience? What do you want them to go check out? Where can they find you? All of that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you guys wanna, you know, if you guys like watches and wanna look at watch conversation, we have really fun content. Not just the commercials, but we sit down and talk about watches and we make jokes and it's 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 actually great. It's a great medium, not so serious. So that's Theo and Harris. We're on YouTube, it's on our website. If you even have a remote interest in watches, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, but more importantly from my bottom line, uh, if you are uh, in control or have any say in your marketing budget at your corporation, and I don't really care how large it is, and you fit in one of those three categories, either you're going to pay our full freight, uh, I'm going to be really excited about the project, or uh, if your name is big enough, I think we sh you should call me because legitimately, while I don't take on too many clients, I like my work-life balance, uh, no one really gets into your sh more than me. I, I download everything. I'm just completely invested. And uh, I'm not saying there isn't a better story storyteller in the world, but I promise uh, if there is, which there is, but you're not talking to him and I'm, I'm the best you're going to get. So uh, call me, <laughs> call me. That's some confidence right there, <laughs> but yeah. well deserved. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I've actually checked out your guys' channel, of course, and so has Nick. And I really like the videos. I'm not super into watches, but like I could see how that channel could pull me into watches <laughs> and, and it was enjoyable. Yeah. It's fun. It's, it's somewhere between like bar stool and watch sure. stuff. You know, it's yeah, just fun. Yeah. 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 It know? wasn't it's... too serious, lighthearted joking around. It was great. Um, exactly. so those will all be down in the, either the show notes or the description if you're watching on YouTube and, uh, let's jump into the founder framework, uh, lightning round. So number one is sure. who is your role model? my dad. dad what is your last meal on earth <laughs> can i cook it because if I yes of course it, then uh then just just a really simple dish of pasta mm. pasta what kind of pasta i would probably just do uh maybe a carbonara Ooh. or something like like know, a red sauce really beautiful yeah. nice T t tastes like home before yeah. i die <laughs> uh, all right next question <laughs> hustle culture yeah simple nay. man Nay. Nay. Uh, yep. Keep it. What's the number one skill set that's helped you get to where you are today? Speaking. Okay. If you weren't working on your current company or companies, what would you be building? Back decision making. Speaking is good, but decision making has made mm -hmm. me more money. Uh, what was the next question? If you weren't working on your current company or companies, what would you be building today? Nothing. Nothing. That's a fair wow. answer. <laughs> Number one lesson you've learned. Sh shut up and listen, you stupid, arrogant prick. Just shut <laughs> up and listen. Just listen. Close your fucking mouth for once, you children. <laughs> and children are, are 15 to 65. Oh, my God. No one knows how to shut the up and listen. Oh, my God. And our last question. What is uh, Nick wanted to add this one? What is your favorite watch? Good question. A Patek Philippe 5004. It's probably about half a million dollars. Oh it's probably yes. about half a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a very stable investment. Mm. So mm -hmm. don't think of it like an expensive watch. Think of it as like a cheap house. Oh, great. <laughs> that you can wear on your wrist. Yeah. A cheap house on your yeah. wrist. Yeah. Yep. yeah. That you can't work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm surprised if we're going to go there. I'm surprised you didn't say Richard Mills. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, you know what? I have a small wrist and I'm, I'm just, you know, I think I <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, thank you so much, Christian. Um, that's a wrap and everyone check them out down in the description below. Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. Watching.